and welcome to Pro Practical Pump Selection for Small Projects. My name is Jenny Callahan, and I'm a PhD student in the Civil and Environmental Department. For this video, I'd like to share some of the lessons I learned during the startup of my mobile pilot system. I call it practical, as the information is less geared towards the engineering practices we learned in fluid mechanics, is more focused on the need to know information when purchasing and installing smaller scale pumps. My pilot system is hosted by a wastewater treatment utility in Inglewood. During installation, I was presented with an interesting pump problem due to the site location and restrictions. Essentially, I needed to pull water 160 feet from a basin to my pilot system with a low flow rate of only one liter per minute. This distance included a seven foot initial vertical rise and there's no option of installing mechanical devices at the basin. There are numerous parameters involved in pump selection, many of which are listed here. I will cover a few of these in, the present, in this presentation to help narrow down the best pump for your application. The nature of the fluid, location, desired performance, hindrances to performance, pump protection, environmental considerations, costs, and life cycle. There are many practical uses for pumps, but typically they involve transferring, mixing, and adding pressure to fluids. I'll focus on these three types of pumps, which are most common to small projects. All of them will move water from one place to another, but they each do it in a different method and with some pumps better suited for particular applications. The centrifugal pump is the most common pump. There are a type of kinetic pump, which adds energy to the fluid being pumped by accelerating it with an impeller. They're good for transferring fluids at constant flow and high speeds. However, if pressure changes, the efficiency and flow rate decrease. Because the impeller comes in contact with the fluid being pumped, damage and excessive wear can be caused with high viscosity fluids. Certain centrifugal pumps can handle solids and abrasive slurries, but these unique features will be based on the manufacturer's unique design. Centrifugal pumps cannot provide suction when dry and running them without a fluid will cause damage to the pump. Peristaltic pumps are a type of positive displacement pump, which deliver a fixed quantity of fluid with each revolution of the drive shaft. Flexible tubing is placed between rollers and the housing. As the pump shaft turns the rollers, the rollers squeeze the tubing, trapping a volume of water and forcing it through to the discharge location. These are most commonly seen in the labs around campus as they're very good with delivering precision volumes and prevent contamination. The fluid being transferred does not touch any of the moving parts of the pump, so corrosion of the pump housing, gears, and motor does not occur. They're capable of moving viscous fluids and of running dry. The drawbacks to these pumps are that they require replacement of the flexible tubing, which wear with time and use. Subsequently, they are not very good with abrasive fluids, which hasten degradation. They're also more expensive than the standard centrifugal pump and are subject to low, lower flow rates. Diaphragm pumps are also known as membrane pumps or another type of positive displacement pump. A reciprocating rod moves a flexible diaphragm within a cavity. The volume of the cavity is increased by the diaphragm moving outward. Pressure decreases and water moves into the chamber. Conversely, when the diaphragm is moved inward, reducing the size of the cavity, water is forced out. These pumps are often seen in RVs and boats for providing steady flow or increasing water pressure from storage tanks. Fluid is retained within the chamber and like the peristaltic pump does not come in contact with the motor. Subsequently, they are capable of handling abrasive or high viscosity fluids and those with high solids content. They are usually quiet, efficient, and capable of running dry. A key factor in deciding which type of pump you'll need is the location where you're going to be using it. This includes where you wanna place it, where you are drawing from the influent or suction side, and where you are discharging to the effluent or discharge side. Generally speaking, pumps have an easier time of pushing fluid rather than pulling it, so placing the pump near the influence source is usually better. You will want to ensure the pump has a proper power source. Even the smallest pumps will have the volts and amps listed on the device or packaging, but typically also include the power, such as horsepower or watts. Check and make sure that the circuit you will be operating on has sufficient current to support your pump without just daisy chaining extension cords. Give the pump a stable space it needs to operate. This includes providing sufficient airflow for pumps that are air cooled. 
Some pumps must be positioned in a particular fashion, such as flat, while others can be stood upright. So it's important to know what these limitations are. A submersible pump has a protective casing for the motor, which allows it to be submerged in the liquid you're trying to move. An inline pump cannot be submerged and means the plumbing configuration must be designed to keep the pump clear of the liquids. When selecting the location of the pump, also consider how often you, meet, you may need to physically access it. Pumps are usually rated for either continuous or intermittent use. Intermittent allows for the pump to, use, pump to be used for about 15 minutes with a 45 minute break for cooling before using it again. Surprisingly large number of pumps do not come with on and off switches, which means unplugging the device from the outlet or wiring a secondary device such as a pressure gauge or float switch. Depending upon the nature of the fluid you are moving, pumps may become clogged and require routine cleaning or de debris removal. Another factor in determining how often you will visit your pump is whether it's self-priming or not. Self-priming means the pump can generate enough initial force to suction liquid from a source generally limited by a given distance. For example, a pump may state it's self-priming up to three feet. This means it can draw water upward into a pump three feet above the water elevation as soon as you turn it on. If a pump is not self-priming, the water source must be above the pump so that gravity forces the fluid into it, or there may be a priming chamber. A priming chamber is a reservoir in the pump that you fill with water. When you turn the pump on, the water within the chamber creates enough suction to draw water from the source. Each time you turn the pump on, you will need to ensure the priming chamber is filled. The next item you need to know is your desired performance. This is usually interpreted as the flow rate. In my system, the desired flow rate was one liter per minute. However, if you're cleaning out a flood in your basement, you'll likely want it removed as fast as possible. Or if you want to power wash your car, you may desire an increase of pressure for your outdoor hose. The desired performance is most often affected by the distance and elevation the fluid must travel and the tubing or pipe size. These factors contribute to what is known as head. Total dynamic head is the amount of energy or pressure needed to move a fluid by the pump. The amount increases with factors such as distance, elevation, temperature, friction, and the others listed here. However, it may be easier to imagine going on a run. A short run is less tiring than a long run. Distance. If you run uphill, you'll expend more energy than you will running down. Elevation. If you try to run on a rocky road or sand, friction will slow you down. You'd likely find it easier to run in 50 degree weather rather than 100 degree weather. And you'll likely slow down for turns or narrow openings. Water behaves similarly. Depending upon the pump manufacturer, this energy can be expressed in a variety of ways. Typically, it's called head and is annotated in feet, but may also be seen in terms of discharge, lift, suction, and pressure. A useful conversion factor is one PSI is equivalent to 2.31 feet of head. Total dynamic head is determined by adding the head from contributing components. Static head is the difference in elevation between the surface of the water on the suction and the discharge side, or in the case of free flowing fluid, the height of the exit. Essentially static head factors in the weight of the fluid and gravity. Water that can move with the help of gravity increases pressure and aids the pump. While moving against gravity works against the pump and requires more energy. Friction head is the amount of energy lost due to friction forces when traveling from the source to the destination. The head required to overcome the friction in the pipe depends on the velocity of the fluid, which is dependent on the diameter, length, smoothness of the pipes, and the number of fittings. The value is typically calculated using the darcy weisbach equation, along with the friction factor and Reynolds number. I recommend a nice Excel spreadsheet or a web app that allows you to calculate this easily based on different pipe diameters, flow rates, and distances. However, rough estimations can be made using online data sources. For example, the website engineeringtoolbox.com provides tables for various lawsuits through different pipe types. If you have a flow rate of two gallons per minute, through one half inch PVC, the friction loss is eight feet for every 100 feet of distance. For my system of 160 feet, this would produce 12.8 feet of head just for the distance traveled through PVC pipe. If I use one inch PVC at the same, same flow rate, this reduces the velocity and the turbulence. Subsequently, the friction loss is only 
0.9 feet of head per 100 feet of pipe. Fittings also contribute to the friction in your system. So the more elbows and valves you use, the more friction losses. For example, my system uses a strainer and three 90 degree elbows. This is equivalent to another 16 feet ahead, which the pump must overcome. Another type of head loss, which may affect your system includes changes in pressure. The fluid vapor pressure, atmospheric pressure, and the use of pressurized containers become important factors in determining head. While not covered in detail for this presentation, I have included some factors which may help you determine if they're an issue for your system design. The pressure above the surface of the liquid will exert a force which can either help or hinder the pump performance depending upon the location. There's less force when the atmospheric pressure is lower, such as at higher elevations, and more force when pressurized tanks are utilized. Cavitation occurs when the pressure at the suction side is too low. Vapor bubbles form in the liquid, and as the fluid passes through the system, the fluid pressure rises, causing the bubbles to collapse. The collapse releases large amounts of energy, which exerts impact forces, damaging the pump components and the overall performance. Vapor bubbles forming in a fluid are based on the vapor pressure. The vapor pressure head is determined by dividing the vapor pressure by a specific weight at a given temperature. Using water as an example, at 50 degrees Fahrenheit creates about half a foot of vapor pressure head, while water at 100 foot, feet 100 degrees Fahrenheit creates two feet of head. In an ideal situation, you'd be able to look at the manufacturer's documents and see a pump curve similar to the one depicted here. Given sufficient information, you can determine the best performance using efficiency, power, flow rate, and mechanism side. For example, impellers for centrifugal pumps. I recommend you dust off your fluid mechanics textbook for additional information on reading this particular type of curve. For small pumps commonly available at Amazon or Home Depot, detailed curves are not available, and at best you'll see a performance curve or a small table such as this one, which you can build your own performance curve from. On this chart, I have the flow rate on the x-axis and the total head on the y. If there's no head on the pump, it will produce a flow rate of 900 gallons per hour. As the amount of head increases, the flow rate decreases. Since this particular pump has no flow at 134 feet ahead, the total head on my system design must be less than that. Once you've purchased the pump, you do not want to waste money on buying a new one or replacement parts. So consider how to protect your pump. Environmental considerations can include protecting the pump from the environment, such as weather, debris, and pets, but also the environment from the pump, which generates noise, chemicals, and power consumption. A significant limitation of some of the pumps involve whether or not they can run dry. For pumps such as the centrifugal pump, often water is the cooling mechanism to keep the motor from overheating. Without it, the motor will overheat, causing fire hazards or melting of component parts. If you suspect there's a chance your water may run dry or you'll get a clog in the line preventing flow, I recommend you purchase a pump that is capable of running dry, such as the peristaltic or diaphragm or implement other safety mechanisms to protect your pump. For example, some pumps have built-in thermal protection which shut off the pump if the motor becomes too hot. Many of the intermittent use pumps do not have this feature as they presume you will use it correctly only for a few minutes at a time and then allow it to cool. If there's no built-in thermal protection, consider wiring an inline thermal switch. A useful device I discovered was something called the pump saver. This device is wired in line with your pump and monitors the current voltage and power consumption. Once you've calibrated the device, it will shut off the pump if there's a current decrease or surge, which protects the pump from dry running, jammed impellers, and over and under voltage conditions. Screens, strainers, and filters are all useful in keeping debris and solids from the inside of your pump. While this is useful in protecting your pump, keep in mind it also creates an additional source of maintenance and cleaning. If your fluid contains debris or solids, such as ponds or wastewater, it's, recommend you, it's recommended you choose a pump that's capable of handling these. Foot valves, also known as one-way or check valves, are useful in that they help keep fluid in the pump or the lines. They're often, often implemented on the suction side to allow water to be pulled into the lines in the pump, but when the pump stops, the valve prevents the water from flowing backwards out of the line. I hope you find some of this information helpful when selecting a pump for your next project. One last recommendation, always consider practical advice from those with empirical knowledge, even if it is just your next door neighbor who installed a similar pond pump in his backyard. Thank you for your time.